All right, welcome everyone to APS Radio episode 35. My name is Jim Bernica, and today I met with my old pal, Allison Phoenix from Pinpoint Behavioral. Hey, Good Jim. afternoon. Hey, good afternoon. Kind of already talked over each other. It tends it to happen. It happens. Yeah, so I, I was able to spend a whole weekend with her at the First Responder Bridge. Amazing program for you. Though, for those of you that are not familiar with that, it's a great place for first responders and their spouses to just really learn about the job and what the job does to those first responders. And you were a part of that. You had your own little segment, a uh, little panel discussion, and I was just there as a peer, which was kind of full circle for me since, um, you know, I went there as an attendee last year. Yeah, it's been an honor to volunteer for them for the last about year and a half. And um, so I just, I help run the clinical team and oversight any one that may be dealing with some stressors or triggers or different situations that come over the weekend. And so it's always a great time and great to see like uh, familiar faces like yours. No, oh, yeah. Really, you you were looking forward to seeing this face. Mug. Yeah, I mean, it's like we were together every week for like a year. So this this is true because that and that's what we're going to talk about today. Is is you and I were really tag team partners and we worked together really well throughout my department. And before we really dive into that, I think it's important to kind of give a background of how that whole thing came about. So this this episode today that we're talking about is you know a checkup from your neck up, just annual clinician visits, actually bringing the clinician into the fire department, uh, which is what we were able to do with you. So to kind of like take a step back and talk about how we got there, um, in 2019, Dayton had a mass shooting in which nine people were killed in our in our bar entertainment district. Mm -hmm. And Marathon Oil actually gave the police and uh, the fire union each $25,000 to use towards um, firefighter health and wellness. And so I was at that point in time, I'm, I'm a member of the union. I can't remember if I was health and safety or trustee at that point, but that doesn't matter. But, you know, I really pitched this idea and it wasn't my idea. I didn't come up with this whole clinician visit. I don't know where I got it from, but the idea, uh, needless to say, was let's bring a clinician in, let's bring them to the firehouses, let's introduce them to the clinicians and you know, if they want to talk, cool. If nothing else, the idea was they would be able to at least know you, uh, have a familiar face. And if anything happens down the road, they would be able to reach out and be that much easier. That was kind of the whole mindset behind it. So we were working. I think, and I think not to toot my own horn, but I think I gave you the idea because we've been doing it with departments since 2018. So maybe. 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 If you want to take credit, I'll let you. I don't really it's remember. Okay. My memory is crap. But it happened. And, and you and Dayton Fire and the, and the local. Um, go ahead. Sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. No, no. How how dare you? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. You know, we we had several different clinicians and um, that were working with our peer team at that point. And we asked, we basically did an application and the, the board looked at everything and we ended up going with you and um and so the idea was again we're going to go to all the firehouses and we're going to meet everybody but before we even did that i thought it was important and this this whole thing i thought worked out really well and and i i can't say that it was purposeful but it just it worked out this way we were able to bring in joe terry as a speaker and she did an amazing job, probably I mean, the best I think anybody could have possibly done to really break down the stigma of behavior health. You know, um, you know, my department is certainly not small. And in order to uh, get everybody through her training, I put, and I still feel bad to it to this day, I put her through 12 trainings in three days. And it was way too much for her, but it was the only way to make sure everybody had an opportunity to see that class. Um, and I think it was brilliant in how it all laid out, like you said, where it was the end of December 
And then we just rolled and launched right into the wellness program, the neck up checkups. That's right. And so you were there for the trainings as well. So not only did oh. Joe do oh, her thing. 16 of them. 12 of them. Or Come 12 on. of them. Come on. I don't know. I've seen a lot of them. So. Yes. Yes. So, yeah. So you were part of that too. So it was like Joe really broke down the stereotypes and broke down the stigma about behavioral health. And I think for the first time, my firefighters were there going, oh, man, uh, this job really has affected me. It was kind of like a light bulb went off with them. And along with that, as soon as Joe was done, we tagged you in. And we basically said, hey, this is Allison. We're going to be bringing around to the stations. And it was a great just introduction. Like you said, it just rolled perfectly because we started like the very next week with our first our first station visits you know and and i think another thing um of value was we were we were yes we were coming to the department but it was a union program and i don't know how it is everywhere else but where i'm at there is there is a certain level of trust that's involved with the union compared to management so when it's when it's something from management a lot of times and you you can step in on this because you're working with a lot of departments now with management but with management a lot of times it's just the lack of trust you know they feel like if they say something it might get back to them and they may get in trouble or whatever else but with the union side of things i think we really had that trust from the start do you, do you yeah, agree I, I agree we had trust straight from the start in yeah, over my time now and a lot of departments we work with, the biggest, and, and we'll talk about this later, but the number one stressor is admin and organizational. And unfortunately, the disconnection that occurs somewhat naturally between leadership and line people um, help kind of increases that, that seg- segregation and unfortunately decreases the connection which then decreases trust and and all that yeah so i remember when we started i kind of had a hypothesis and i really felt that not a whole lot of people would take up take you up on this opportunity and talk to you i felt like maybe a few per station per crew would but ultimately people wouldn't want to be in there for any length of time because the thought would be that you know all the other members of the crew are going oh something something really must be going on with bob you know he's been in there for a while and and i think it's important to note too when we did this we took the crews out of service so it was it wasn't a bad thing. They actually enjoyed that they had a little bit of time to relax and not take any runs because we're all every every career is busy where I'm at. Um so so that was my hypothesis. And and again, the hope was if nothing else, they saw you, you gave them a business card, and if anything helped, anything happened later on, they call you, or if they didn't want to talk to you right then and there. Maybe as soon as you leave, they'd give you a call or the next day. That was my hope. And yeah. more than anything, I wanted to just introduce you to everybody. Yeah, I that- think the way the way that, you know, and, and we'll get through some of the changes and the barriers we experienced. But every time I was at a station, you were my point of contact that was with me, introducing me, making them feel like, hey, this is somebody we can trust. You made it very you know, casual and it wasn't stiff. Also sometimes bringing donuts was helpful. And then, like you said, just it, it, they were mandated to, to say hi. Well, they're supposed to, um, but they didn't have to talk, right? So they don't have to come sit down and tell me everything going on, but they were highly recommended to at least see me. But at the end of the day, I'm never going to force anyone who doesn't want to stop. And, yeah. and we'll get into the numbers later and what we found out. Yes. So like you said, I, I went along with you and it was a, basically we had, you and I basically had a, usually a Friday date 
um, every week, uh, in which we went to crew to crew, station to station. Each the way we did it, it was very easy for us. Um, Dayton has twelve stations. There's twelve months in a year. Yeah, I mean, it, it just it made sense. What? I know it was what? brilliant. I taught. I maxed out right there. Like that was as good as it gets for me. And then on weeks where we had either um, a station with only a few folks, we would either pick up headquarters, go to the training center, you know, we'd find time. And there were, there were some weeks where I think I did more than one day every once in a while. Um, but yeah, every Friday, um, cause my husband's Kelly day. So I guaranteed I had childcare and uh, yeah, we, you and I would just go at it and we would be there as long as we needed to be. And the glorious thing too, about, having the point of contact from the clinician side is you knew, Hey, there's some things that have happened. Let's go over here and chat with this unit, with this platoon. So that was really helpful. So I wasn't looking for the ISU to call me on a crisis. Like you already kind of knew, Hey, they had a bad call or this person's struggling. And it was so confidential that no one knew why we're there. And sometimes we just slip in the side door, chat with somebody and leave. Yeah, so it, really, was, it was really um, awesome to have you doing that. The, having a finger on a pulse and knowing what was going on definitely made it easy. And we, even though we had a plan, we actually had a bulletin where it listed out all the times we were going to be there. It wasn't that big of a deal to have a detour. Like, and I had, I had the ability to do that, you know, it was flexible, you know, and, um, you know, again, I remember the first time we did this, I didn't know how it was going to go. And I mean, everybody that even that first day, everybody sat down and talked to you. And I just remember just feeling just great inside. Like if this is how it's going to go, this is going to be tremendous. Cause I also know, and this is the same way. I mean, wherever you go, um, you know, you met with that first crew they actually used you. They they um, sat down with you, talked to you, they, and they it was a good experience. And guess what? They're going to tell that crew the next morning, and so on and so forth. So it wasn't very long before everybody really knew what we were doing, and they knew that it was actually a good experience, and that you were really easy to talk to. It was very casual, um, and it was again, it was done the right way it was confidential nothing was going to management it's it's a union-led program and uh just from the start things i thought really went well yeah agreed, agreed. oh that, there's a special guest appearance who's that sorry yeah i may have to grab them so yeah everyone this is uh my special guest he is over here uh blabbering up a storm tucker tucker meet everyone what's up tucker Hi. Of Tucker. Tucker is six months old today. He's so. already got more hair than me. <laughs> I think everyone has more hair than you. Uh, uh, uh. All right. So, you know, we went around, we went station to station, crew to crew. We did this for a while. Um, and I know you were taking some analytics mm -hmm. uh, when we were doing this because it's it's important to show the numbers because you want to, you know, the idea was to continue and do this and on and on and the marathon money that we had that's that's one time money so the idea was or i guess the hope was that we could prove the value in this program and either the union or the department actually pick it up and pay for it you know um yeah. so that was that was the goal so we had to have numbers but we also yep. had to make sure everything was confidential as well. Will you kind of talk about some of the numbers and data that you were picking up? Yeah. So from the clinician side, I, you know, all besides writing somebody's name down, I didn't collect any additional information. You know, I didn't write down what people said and it, and it didn't go anywhere, but with me, but I did every quarter provide some data pertaining to three specific areas. The first area was had they ever talked to a clinician before? Um, the second area was, did we give any referrals or resources to somebody? You know, it could have been a referral about 
their kid or their mom or themselves or ADHD testing or financial support. It could have been for anything, but you know, on the, on the uh, report, we don't indicate what the referrals were, just how many we gave. And then the last piece was what was the main stressor, which is quite interesting when we get to the data. So over a whole year, you know, we went to each department, each platoon, you know, once a month, we went to each station, which covered about almost half of the, the department, which our goal was half one year, half another year, which um, if we, if we wrapped it up to more than once a week, we would have been able to do everyone, but just the way it all, all, all happened. And so out of everyone we saw in that year, the, um, the amount of people that were offered to see me, 92% engaged in a wellness check voluntarily, 92%. So total was, I think 15 people, only 15 people did not want to talk to me. Let's, let's and touch on that real quick. And that's before, okay. Right. Before we go any further, like, cause, yeah. I, cause I think it's, we, we talked about this before we, we know like what happened. Um, yeah. Is, is so, I was, I was, do you want to go ahead? You want to take it? Yeah. Go for it. Well, I mean, I'll give my side. So, um, since I probably sh- should be the one talking about something happened on the admin side with Dayton in the summer of 2022, when we were doing our checks, which changed who my point of contact was going to be. When that point of contact changed, the, so again, my point of contact goes with me to the station. They introduce who I am, make it feel really, really comfortable, really confidential, private. So when that point of contact changes, when I saw people start declining to be seen by me. And you can give your the rest of it if you want. Yeah, you said you said it very politically correct. Um, I basically got kicked out of that position, and I I had my own issues and went away to Center of Excellence and all that kind of stuff. But the program went on. Um, yeah. But the reality of it was when you and I were together. I think I had the oh, trust of the members. Yeah. And very very few people. I mean, it was maybe what we four or traction. five people <laughs> yeah like, and we act- and we had tr- traction going to where we were being utilized often which and on on your end burnt you out it did <laughs> it did it's a lot but uh when i when i left they put somebody in there that uh did not have that trust um and i think the program kind of suffered because of that so i guess the point being made of all that is it's very important to make sure you have somebody that does have the trust and respect that's going to go around with the clinician and introduce things. Um, because when, if you don't have that person, if it's somebody they just don't trust, like they're not going to participate. Correct. And I'm seeing that in other places too. Good. Yeah. Okay. As well as, I mean, this, once the once the gate opens you will get people wanting support and help and so it is a lot and on your defense it's a lot on a wellness coordinator or the point of contact whatever you want to call yourself and so making sure you have your support you have what you need because i don't know about remember if you remember this the amount of calls we would get all hours of the night and on the weekends there was you know trauma and crisis don't have days off that's right and for us i mean christmas eve i think we were working with somebody right i mean hello it It, it, it doesn't it doesn't matter it was like once once we once we started like the machine just started rolling and 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 it was it was almost in a weird way like what did we create uh because <laughs> because it was the 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 need was was finally there like people and it was great that people were finally actually picking up the phone people were finally yeah. admitting that they were having issues that is amazing but at the same time it was a lot for you and a lot 
for me. Like it's just, it wasn't, it, we, we needed more of us. Because um, in a two year period prior to this, I think it was two years, y'all had the shootings. You had uh, a fellow officer die by suicide. You had the tornadoes and some really wretched car accidents that were pretty, pretty nasty. Um, some pediatric deaths, some ab child abuse cases that were all over the news. Like there was some nasty things that your the members experienced. And a lot of them just stuffed that down and held it. And they when they finally unloaded, it was on you. Yeah. It was on you. Yeah. You know, I could you would come in sometimes and I would just know that you went through some stuff like there you heard some stuff uh, that was probably had been so, uh, waiting to come out for a long time well better out than in that's that's true that's true that's what shrek says right yes so what were <laughs> what were some of those other you know i kind of jumped in there when we were talking about the, the numbers yeah. and data again what kind of finish up there please yeah so um 15 people did not want to talk to me. Um, and that's totally fine. Again, I, if they are absolutely refusing, I'm never going to force somebody to talk. That's the worst thing you want. We gave, uh, 50 through 53 referrals. So I forget the percentage of that, but, um, we gave a lot of referrals out either to us, to other practices, and we don't segregate. You don't just have to come to us. Um, again, and it could have been for every, anything, but the main the main areas in almost all the whole quarter, the whole year. So we separated by quarter and almost all four quarters, almost the number one issue was workplace problems. Second being trauma and third being family or marriages. And it's interesting to me because we work with an organization out of Colorado called National Emergency Responder and Public Safety Center. And before we had even gotten connected with them, you know, we're, st we're starting to see the trend that admin and organizational stress is the number one stressors for public safety. And after we started training with them, and now they're bought by Corpco, but after we started training with them, they, they confirmed that is the case. The number one stress for public safety is administration and organizational stress. And everywhere we go where I teach, I mean, now at this point, I don't even know how many departments that yeah, everyone agrees. The job can suck. The the calls can really really suck. But if you don't have support coming back to the station, if you don't have somebody you can talk to, we know the number one way to prevent PTSD is post trauma perceived support. If you don't have that, and you feel like your boss is a excuse my French a dick or not going to listen to you, then people will be miserable. And they'll say, well, it's leadership. It's this, it's that. Yeah, we need to get back to the table, everyone. And what I mean is the kitchen table. Good deal. Now, since you, here's the other, how many, you remember how many people you ended up actually seeing and how many of yeah. those, it was their first time ever seeing the clinician? Mm -hmm. Yes. So we saw um, 188. So your department had around 325. So we saw 188, which was 58% of membership total. And of those, we saw 92%. Um, and the first time that ever saw a therapist was just about 50%. So half, half of them is 47 to be exact. 47% of the individuals had never talked to a therapist. Which, to be honest, I thought that number would have been higher. So yeah. I was pleasantly surprised that people had either, either, yeah, I've talked to a therapist when I was a kid, or I've done marriage counseling, or yeah, I see somebody currently. Awesome. Like, that's great. Um, so they were already open to it. But to be able to hit, and again, we've only hit half of them. So to, so to know that half of the half has never talked to a therapist, we were able to open the gateway to communication and to destigmatizing therapy. Do you do you remember there being like any stories of just horrific experiences talking to clinicians? 
Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. I've had, uh, I've had people tell me about therapists that they would sit and therapists would talk the whole time. Um, you know, yeah, I, I met with a therapist, but they talked about themselves the whole time, which is not a good sign or they just didn't get it. That's a lot of what I hear that they just didn't understand. They don't get what I do. And not yeah. that that's horrific, but I mean, that's going to deter a lot of people from seeing a therapist. But that's, and I guess I was kind of setting you up for my, my next big point, which was when you, if you're going to bring in a clinician into your department, you have to make sure that clinician actually gets us gets our job what we do how we do things and they're relatable and yeah. and that they're they're you know cool to be with like you know i feel like you only have truly for this you have one opportunity you know if if you if you get low bid you know you gotta be careful with what you're gonna be bringing in because if it's a shitty clinician if it's somebody that is just not good at their job, these firefighters may do this and they may have an adverse experience. And because of that, it's going to be that much harder from there for them to ever reach out again. Mm -hmm. So making sure if you're going to do this program, you better have the right person. Um, and, because and you may actually, only get one chance. Yeah. And I'd actually recommend, and, and if you wouldn't be taking me around the city every Friday, I would have stayed with each crew and done ride alongs. And so I'd recommend like if, and I have, I have a whole segment on how to implement a wellness program from the clinician side, but I'd walk, I'd recommend that they stay, have lunch with them, go on ride alongs. That's the only way they're going to get culturally aware with your department. That's right. Cause now you've worked with a ton of departments. Each department is different, right? Everyone's different and all their calls are different and they're, population could be more urban or more rural or more older adults and you know it just depends and um that changes and shifts then their stress level and what may stress them out versus an inner city like your own All right so if you don't mind actually talk about your experience because since you've been with me you've now i mean worked with especially because the the state of Ohio had a bunch of ARPA money that they, mm -hmm. they gave to departments for behavior health. So you've been able now to do these uh, neck up checkups, police departments, fire departments, you know, all throughout Southwest Ohio. Yeah. So we actually started before you. So in 2018, we started doing neck up checkups um, through actually an EAP and that went beautifully. We found that, the, the first year we had done them with a specific department, 0%, zero individuals were using their EAP services. After we did them in the first year, it went to 30%. 30% of the individuals ended up engaging and utilizing their EAP services after the neck up checkup, which is incredible. Like it's a service that's being paid for, you know, but they didn't know there was competent clinicians. So since then, yeah, we do police departments, fire departments, communication or dispatch um, divisions as well. And with the grants that we get, um, we are what I call a hybrid embedded. So we are there a lot, um, normally at least once to twice a week. We do trainings. We're there for critical incident. If they want us, we don't just show up unless they ask, because that's the last thing is like, why is this therapist there? Um, and, and we're there often. I have a whole team, so I'm not with every department. Some of my teams with, um, a diff, you know, with their own departments, normally we have like a behavioral health first responder therapist, um, like a manager with each department. So there's a main point of contact and that's worked out beautifully. And so with the neck up checkups, again, it's a, it's a undivided attention and time that they get with a the therapist. They can just come say hi, or they can be there up to an hour. Sometimes some people go a little bit longer and that's okay. We're not going to tell them to, you got to stop talking, but it's really breaking down the walls. It's incredible to see how welcomed we are now from years ago to now and how people are ready and willing to start getting help. 
I was just with a department um, last week. So I've been doing a lot of third shift and night shift, trying to, you know, meet the demands. And it's not just, you know, public safety is 24 hours a day. And I met with this older gentleman and it's going to make me tear up. Um, we did our training. Our, we do a mental health 101 training. And then he came in and he just was saying, I've never had a therapist that understood what we do. And I've gone to so many. And he's like, and I had given up. And he starts crying. He said, you know, telling me things that have happened. And I said, sir, you don't have to tell me all this. He goes, <laughs> he said, I just, <clears throat> excuse me. I just, I just want to know, can I have your business card? And I was like, absolutely. Do you want to schedule right now? He's like, yes. So, you know, we're making the impact because you know, the most likely time somebody dies by suicide is when they retire. So if we can hit them before that, way before that. And I know Dayton does a great job at starting in the academy. I teach at academies, letting them know now what they may experience, building some resiliency tools so they can do their best that they can to combat what they're going to experience and have support. That's, yeah, that's awesome. That's so cool to hear, you know, yeah. and. You know, again, you and I were just in Columbus. Uh, we were just, you know, doing the bridge thing. And during the bridge thing, a big part of that production is Columbus's EAP, Lisa mm -hmm. and Rashad. Mm -hmm. And um, that is that is kind of the, not the typical, what I've considered EAP, you know, mm -mm. the, you know, and it's a large enough city to where they can have their own, but they, they are, um, culturally competent uh they know the fire side they know the police side and those guys and gals there love them i can't say the same even though i'm you know the city i came from is not a small city it wasn't columbus size so um i've, I've been with eap other people have done stuff with eap but it's it's just not the same as like what columbus has so i do view you know, the, the private practices that specialize uh, in trauma and police and fire and, and military, like that is, I mean, you are the perfect alternative. Like we're not big enough to have justify having our own, but we could still contract with you and have you do, you know, those annual visits, have you for crisis calls. Um, those, that's, those are all options for all these departments. Yeah. It's just, they actually just need to make this a priority. And if you look at the amount of money that people are spending to retain and um, cover people when they go off for FMLA, mental health, if they have to take sick leave to go to treatment, if we're again able to quantify that time by having a clinician available and having resources and starting early, then we can reduce that cost in terms of like um, um, a, a township or a city, reduce the cost of the time off. So, I mean, it, it works. There's, there's data out there saying that this works. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. You know, I know we, we covered a lot in a short mm -hmm. period. Um, I know if you want to know more about like what I did and how I did things, you should look into the December issue of fire engineering the creating and enhancing your fire department wellness program. So, mm -hmm. um, and that's your also, hair when you do that. <laughs> Oh, my beard hair. Um, <laughs> and I think there's going to be my, that article is going to be uh, a digital version is going to be available that coincides with this talk that you and I are doing. How yeah. cool is that? Do you find that there's anything you would have changed Thinking back, would you have done anything differently? No, I, 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 other than me actually be there for the duration. No, I, I don't think so. I think, I think I had the trust and the ear of my members. And I, I think, um, they trusted me and you were an extension of that. And you were able to prove yourself quite early on, um, that you were legit and that you could help people. And 
um, I know it made a difference in um, the members that we did see. And it, and it continued. Um, I just, I mean. And we still get calls. You know, it's, I mean, I, I definitely, look, I know things happen with me and I know it, it, it kind of hurt the program and it hurt you as well. And it happened and it is what it is. Um, and I definitely have regrets because I, and I always think that um, I got my, you know, I got pulled out of the game too early and I had more to give and I could have done more. Um and there's, but there's nothing I can do about that now, unfortunately. Yeah. So it's like, like doing this show, writing that article, every, you know, you know, being a peer at the bridge, all these other things that I'm doing now, I still have purpose. I just know that it's different than what it was. And, you know, but I, I do wish that, I mean, my, you know, full disclosure, my, my goal truly was to have you come in to do this and and be so well received that you know you actually became you know the, the city of dayton's fire and police um clinician you basically we did have that version like columbus has like that was that was my goal and i kind of felt like we were on the way until shit happened you know maybe we started something and you never know how it's gonna end i don't know mm-hmm. I don't know, but um, I mean, everything, I, I wouldn't change anything that was in my control. I thought that the way we went about it was the right way. It yeah. was, it was, it was honest. I mean, it was pure. Like it truly, I wanted to help them and, and they, they needed help then and they certainly need help now. I would also put two more points, like if somebody is listening to this and really truly wanting to make sure they have a good wellness program is you had a good peer team. Yeah. You had a really good, I mean, a great peer team of people that it didn't always rely on you, uh, on your shoulders. I know it did a lot of times, but it, it, that makes a huge impact. And so you had people to your right and your left that you could rely on as well. To, so if you went on vacation, Yes, I know you still got calls, but you could ask, hey, let's have this person manage it. And the second piece is you developed great relationships with treatment facilities. And Mm. you learned the process to make it streamlined. So when you were with a member in crisis, you knew exactly who to call. You knew what to say, what information you needed from the member before you even got on the call. And so that is another testimony to the work that you did. And I mean, I know even before you stepped in your position, there were people already paving that way. And I think it's really important that we honor them as well because it's hard work. Oh, absolutely. You know, and I still, I mean, I still get calls just like you get calls. I get calls. People Mm -hmm. know that I'm, I'm, I, (laughs) against my will, I've become, a good resource and what i mean by that is i've been to the bridge i've been to ohio assist i've had the stella ganglion block um i went to save a warrior I've spent 40 days at a center of excellence like if you want to know about a facility or procedure you know emdr or whatever i'm your guy because i could tell you my personal experiences you um, didn't have to go down the rabbit hole to go to all those places to experience them you know that jim right <laughs> I'm just kidding. I wish. I wish. Uh, that was the case, right? I wish. But now, you know, that's the thing. Like, I kind of, you know, AJ's talk this weekend resonated okay. with me. And it was, and his one oh, of his no. Big, Oh, huh? no. It's what? a popo. Oh, no, it's a popo. That's right. Um, You know, was one of his, one of his big points at the end. And it was just, it's called the comeback. And I, I, it just resonated with me because I did finally feel like I went through an awful lot of shit, mm. um, but I'm, I'm back and I, and I feel stronger than I was beforehand, you know, that whole resiliency thing. Um, and it just, it felt good to be full circle going from an attendee to a peer this weekend. And, uh, I mean, it wasn't lost on me. I realized how impactful that was. And, 
And I was happy that I was finally in a place to where I could come back and do this and do it the way I did. So mm -hmm. again, I wish I was nothing more that it was you and me every Friday hanging out and, and doing this stuff. Um, and, but that's, that's not in the cards, but you can still do your stuff and, and I could do what I do. And it's just, just looks different, but it's still impactful. We always continue to help and support each other. Yeah. And that's, and that's a piece with wellness. It's, it's about all of us. You know, it takes literally the village. It takes everyone. And so if somebody's listening or watching this and they're like, yes, we need to start this, how would they get a hold of you or I? No, I'm supposed to ask that question. Oh, well, there you go. I asked it for you. <laughs> I'm, I'm easy. I'm on uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, OnlyFans. I'm on all that stuff. Oh, you got an OF now? I didn't know, bro. <laughs> oh, yeah. Firefighter cancer feet. That's my handle. Are you for real? No, no, you never no, know I do. You. I do that. That's like the last slide that I show in my firefighter cancer program. And that gets the best laugh of them all. And I, and I always threaten the classmates, like, don't make me take these shoes off. You're not ready for this. Oh God, that's disgusting. Wow. This went sideways really quick. It, did. it? it, it tends to happen that way. Yeah, no, I'm I'm Jim Bernica Jr. at gmail.com. What are you? Allison, A L I S O N, at pinpointbhs.com. Uh, you can find me on Facebook. I don't discriminate, and I'm more than welcome to help anyone wherever it needs to be. Um, we have an Instagram for Pinpoint, and I believe a Twitter for Pinpoint. Our social media person does that now. Um, but the easiest way is just to find our website, www.pinpoint bhs.com and you can find out more information do you have a myspace uh it's probably still active somewhere okay tom is still out, your friend out, out in outer space <laughs> <laughs> uh, i don't know, I don't know. <laughs> it's all good i appreciate it jen You're, again this that's what i'm supposed to say sorry i you, should just be the host you should be the host <laughs> no it's always great hanging out with you. It's always great talking to you. I'm so appreciative to everything we've done together. And and I look forward to working some more and doing some things. However that looks like with you, you're you're always my girl. Thank you. You as well. And I hope that whoever's I'm, listening to this I'm knows your girl. That, yeah, you're my girl. You're my you're my boy blue. But I hope whoever's listening to this knows that it's this isn't brain surgery to start if you want to get going. Get a good clinician, have him come in, do some ride-alongs. Like you can help help create this culture shift that we're currently in and work on destigmatizing mental health. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Making the time. Thanks. Little little guys fell falling asleep in your lap. He's out. He's out. I well, I don't want to get in your lap, but I think it's time for a nap for me too. So she's Allison. And I'm Jim, and I'm going to take a nap. Thank you, guys.